Happy Monday, everybody. It's time for another edition of Ask Mike, and luckily, this is a winning edition of Ask Mike. We're talking would, about a win. It would be so much easier to do the show today. We don't have to be mean and no, say mean can, things about people. No, we can smile. Actually, I'm going to turn it on the internet, people, and say mean things about them. Oh, wow. Because they've been saying mean things, so we can say mean things back now, oh, right? Oh, well, I, I think that's how this goes. Let's jump right into it. I'm excited <laughs> to see what the show holds for today. Our first question comes from Hannah Smith, who asks, did the Florida win shock you? I noticed you picked Arkansas to lose by by a few points in that pregame show that y'all do, you seemed a little skeptical about what Guyton could do at a job he's never had. I believed in him all the way. Well, I think it's great that you believed in him, but clearly <laughs> she believed in him on faith. Yes. Because there's there was no real hard evidence to know what he was going to do. I mean, we got Sam Pittman saying, oh, they all like him. We're working on simplifying the playbook. But we didn't go out there and see any of this. We didn't. We weren't sure what they were working on. Anything new? What does this mean? Simplifying the playbook. Uh, if he says the players are all buying in, that's fine. But we weren't around any players. The players did get on TV and say, "Yeah, we like him." Well, what are they supposed to do? We don't like this guy. <laughs> we Can hate we him. have <laughs> the other guy back, or we don't want either one of them? So, you know, it's. Having faith is great if you're a fan. If you do what we do and you want to be sort of accurate, you have to be cautious. And I am anybody that knows me knows I'm the most cautious guy there is. I really hate to make predictions. I hate to tell people this is going to happen. 48 years of doing this, and I still don't know because it is. that's what makes sports good. It's, it's unpredictable. That's what makes it fun. I like the fact that it's unpredictable. I did not see this happening. And here's why. Again, I'm having to speculate, but I, I speculated that you have a, a former wide receivers coach who's familiar with this offense, but from the standpoint of the receivers. And I thought, okay, what he's going to do is we've heard all these complaints this year about receivers not getting open early. KJ needs to throw the ball. He needs to people need to break open early. I thought, okay, he's going to come up with some pass routes. He's going to change the passing game. We're going to see KJ get rid of it downfield instead of these lateral screen passes. They're going to be downfield a little bit. We're going to see a lot of that. So I had no question. There was no question in my mind the passing game would probably be better. But Sam Pittman has said it all year long, and I've believed him because I believe this. The real problem they've had is no running game. And how is Kenny Guyton going to give them a running game? Now, again, there were rumors that Pittman was going to step in finally and help with the offensive line. So I thought, okay, that might get, make it better. We'll see. But again, I don't know. Then I looked at Florida. And this is what people do not get about Florida. They're a different team at home than they are on the road. You can say, oh, they're not very good. Well, they're good at home. They were. Coming into this game, they were undefeated at home. They were averaging 35 points a game. And listen to me, they were giving up 11 points a game. And that included a game against Tennessee, a team that's not dog meat. Yeah. They're second in the East right now. They were ranked 11th when Florida played them. And Florida beat them handily. Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting there going... How are you going to score? Okay, the offense, the defense might lower that 35 some, but how are you going to push your offense up that much past 11 points a game against some good teams that they play? And I just didn't see it happening. So what did really shock me? Okay, we got some stats, and I'm going to show you what shocked me. <laughs> I'm very excited okay, to see let, those stats. Let's look at this. The first eight games of the season – Arkansas averaged 109 yards per game rushing. In this game, 226 <laughs> yards. They had 42 yards rushing against A&M, 36 yards rushing in the Ole Miss game. They were terrible against Western Carolina in the first game of the year. So 226 yards in this game. Now look at this. They didn't have a 100-yard rusher all year. Rocket, 103 yards, but more importantly, 5.7 yards a carry. Mm -hmm. K.J. Jefferson, 92 yards, 5.4 yards a carry. You don't do that without the offensive line improving. You just can't. If you think you can, and I've had people argue with me about this. One guy told me, a friend of mine, he goes, oh, come on. He said, K.J. just ran over some guys. Rocket just ran over some guys. You need to go back and look at the game. They ran over people downfield. 
They didn't run over people at the line of scrimmage. There were holes they were running through. But to top it off, Bo Limmer was named the SEC Lineman of the Week. Not the co Not co. No co in sight. He was the Lineman of the Week. You don't get that. Arkansas, they're really stingy about giving Arkansas any of these kind of honors. Mm -hmm. I would have, that shocks me that a guy that everybody had given up on, oh, he's not any good, he's experienced, but he can't play center. And he's, he's the player of the week. Yeah. All of this stuff is just leaves me flabbergasted. Now, again, people say, oh, come on, Irwin, you're getting too excited about this. Excited about something that I never thought could happen? I don't care where you're playing, I didn't think this would happen. So, yes, I was shocked by that and never saw it coming. And that's why I thought they'd probably lose the game. And Alyssa was the only one that, of, of us that picked them to win, I think. Am I right on yeah, that? No, I think Evan also okay, picked Arkansas. Evan. Those so, two picked them to win. Yeah. Props to them. But I'm trying to be honest on that pregame show. Yeah. And I just felt like, man, they just don't have the offense to do it. And they did. And I give them props and, and freely admit I was just totally baffled by yeah. when I was watching that. And well, it didn't happen the whole game. It happened toward the end. That's when it started working. And to be fair, there was a lot of things, and even I mentioned it on that pregame show, that Florida had a lot to play for just like Arkansas did they as did. well. bowl Flor eligibility. Flor yeah, Florida was trying to get bowl eligibility. They have a really tough schedule after, the, after that Arkansas go game. Go to LSU, go to Missouri, and then come back home and play uh, Florida State, yeah. a game they're going to get beat in. They, absolutely. So they're, they're going to lose all three of those games. Exactly. So they're probably not going to make a bowl now. So, so that this was, was huge. this was their bowl game. This was what they needed to win. They also debuted those black uniforms for the first time in program history, and they wanted to win in an alternate uniform, something that they really have not had success with in the past. I mean, I remember when they debuted those Gator skin uniforms, Gator whatever it was. Terrible. Terrible loss in them. Awful. It was not good. So they have a lot to play for as well. So the, I went back and forth all week long. I said, you know, everyone came up to me and said, Courtney, who are you picking? And I said, honestly, I don't know. It'll come down to Saturday. I have no idea. The Gators were also down three starters as well. Yeah. And so that was huge on, on, on their part, too. That helped Arkansas just a little bit. Not but then too Arkansas much. Arkansas loses a, a, guy, a tight end, the second exactly. one this year, and then lost Armstrong yep. fairly for, at a, a point in which they still needed him. Exactly. And put a backup guy in there that hadn't caught that many passes, and he catches the winning pass. I think that's what shocked me the most is that you go up. What ha It was the way the game happened that shocked me most, not that Arkansas won it, but the fact that they went up 14 nothing so quickly. And then Florida came back, and it was just a dogfight from then on out. I thought for sure Arkansas going up 14 nothing, that it was going to be an easy route from, from then on out for the, uh, for, for the Hogs, and, and it wasn't. The Gators made that a ball game. Well, the bottom line is, yes, it surprised me, and I'm glad <laughs> she had faith. I don't operate on I, faith. I need information. You do, and we didn't get to see practice that week. We don't get to see practice this week, so... Uh, it'll be interesting to see how they do in the final three games of the season. We have much more to talk about concerning that game. And I think the next question is going to be, Man Without a Tribe says, I was the last man on the Pittman train, but even I think his time at Arkansas has passed. The state of the O-line is absolutely inexcusable. And yesterday did nothing to change that opinion. Ooh. Okay, the first part of that, I'm going to assume that's a figure of speech. I was the last guy on the Pittman train because I promise you he's not one of the last because there's probably more no. people on that train than this. No, we're, on, we're on the plane, Mike, just to tell you a quick story. We're on the plane coming back to Arkansas. We're talking to Arkansas fans who are like, we hope Pittman stays around for another year. We really like him. We really like what he was doing. We like Guy. And, they, there are people that still support Sam Pittman. Well, a lot the problem of them. is if you if you're just on the internet, we talked about it last week. <laughs> you get a skewed view of what's out there. You do because the internet tends to be negative, and that if you did a poll on the internet, well, I've seen it before, it'll skew really bad. Mm -hmm. If you did one of the whole fan base, it would be different. So I think it's a figure of speech. He's not actually saying I'm the last guy. Yeah, that was yeah, yeah. But absolutely inexcusable for the O line. Here's what he needs to do. 
and he won't probably because I know how the internet works. But you made that statement. Now go back and look at the game and mm -hmm. tell me there was no blocking that led to the 200 and whatever, 26 yards rushing. It wasn't blocking. It was just what? It just, they vanished. <laughs> they, they put on those, uh, they had uniforms that had those invisible fabric. The running and backs the just trucked through everyone. That's what happened. Or they just ran over yeah. everybody. Yeah. Come on. I mean, give me a break. I mean, to say that the O-line was inexcusable, they, they made some mistakes. But they came back and won. They won the game. Look, they were they were losing. They came back. They took the lead. The defense is gassed. They lose the lead. You come back and get tied back up, and then they give it up again, and, mm -hmm. and they're in a position to kick the winning field goal, and, and then they win it in overtime with a touchdown. So you know, don't say the old line is inexcusable. Yeah. What's inexcusable is being so mad about something. Oh, I want this guy fired. Oops. He did something that'll probably keep him here for sure. I'm mad. I'm going to say it's inexcusable what these guys did. When it wasn't. any evidence that you look at shows that it was it not only wasn't inexcusable, it was much improved over what uh, we've seen. Yeah, I, I I was on the sidelines for the game, and and there was a few of the Florida writers that came over, and they know me, and they they said they turned to me and they go. Uh, this is not the same offensive line that we've watched in games past. And I said, I know. I'm, I'm just as amazed as you guys are looking at what they've been able to do. Also, you just mentioned it, Mike. Why don't you go and tell the SEC that the O-line wasn't good and they take away that Bo Limmer uh, offensive yeah, lineman of the week? You guys are so stupid. Why did you do that? It was inexcusable what, what he and the other guys did. C give me a break. Yeah, I, I, I think I definitely disagree with Man Without a Tribe. He just wants to be mad over something. Don M. says, big predictions off a single win over a mediocre team regardless of the stadium. Okay, <laughs> now I'm going to divide that into two parts. Okay. I, I can't with these Mediocre guys. team. Okay, you might make the point now when you look at their record, say, yeah, they're mediocre. But they weren't mediocre at home. I no. go back to what I said before. You're winning, you're scoring 35 a game, you're holding opponents to 11, and that schedule wasn't just wimpy. I mean, they beat a really good Tennessee team there. So that's not a mediocre team there. And then to say, regardless of the stadium, okay, you mean that stadium where you've never won before? Yeah. Nobody's ever won from Arkansas, yeah. won there? That's never happened, but yeah. regardless, that's just uh, – that, that, that's not even a factor. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to know if Don M was there for the game or has ever been to a Gator game. As someone who's been to a whole lot of games in the swamp, it's a pretty dangerous place to play because when you get in there, ninety thousand people can pack out that stadium. Uh, it's like a bowl, kind of a little bit the way it's they call designed. It a swamp for a reason. They call it a swamp for a reason. It's incredibly hot down there. You, I mean, you sweat no matter if you're on the field. You just feel like it's a hundred degrees. I don't care. It was seventy and beautiful that day it was 100 degrees on the field and it's loud it really is when they were getting crazy they call third downs money down and when they were jumping up and down getting crazy on third downs I was surprised Arkansas was able to convert on some of those it was so dang yeah. loud in there I I disagree completely with that <laughs> statement regardless 100 percent regard that's crazy. Now, I will say, look, Florida may, maybe is a mediocre team. I would say maybe okay. But regardless of the stadium, regardless of the stadium, Mike, no. where do you find these people? Well, again, <laughs> they're, if they're on Twitter, but the point is this is what happens when you're mad that they won. Exactly. So you just try to make people believe stuff that's just absolutely crazy. That's just not crazy. true. That's just not true. Um, there's some people in the in the Gator fan base like that, too. We were hearing them after the game, too. But Razor Alex 88 says, here I am for another therapy session with Mike and Courtney. We're glad you're with us, <laughs> Razor Alex 88. But it's an after-win session and not an after-loss therapy session. Finally. Hope Courtney is okay with the Hogs beating her alma mater. Love you, Courtney, but whoop pig. I am okay with it. And, I'll, and you know why, Mike? because the players after the game, I got to film that celebration and watching K.J. Jefferson smile and run and hug Kenny Guyton and pick him up, that made me happy. We know enough about Razor Alex 88 and the questions he's been asking each week to know that he's kind of on the edge. He, he's, been, <laughs> he's been about to get off the Pittman train. He's he, been upset. He has, yeah. But here's what I'm telling you, the difference between a fan like this and the other type. If we talk to him right now, I guarantee he wouldn't say, yeah, it's, everything's okay now. They're, they're going to win out, and Pittman's going to win 12, 10 games next year and everything. He's not going to say that. No. But what he's able to do 
and those pl fans on the plane and most fans is he's able to say, you know, this week it's fun. It hasn't been fun. We're going to enjoy this week, and then what happens next week happens. But we're, gonna, we're not going to allow this to make us mad, let the anger carry over and just this didn't happen. Because if you're like that, you should never be a fan. There are too many other things you can do. If, if you have reached a point where it makes you angry because you want to fire a guy, when they do something like that, the first time ever in the swamp, and then as you mentioned, can you sit? tell me that you sit there and watch Kenny Guyton run around like Musselman with his shirt off and they're all going eight. And they're and going crazy for him. And you're going to tell me that you just look at that and you're mad? I, I mean, you've got to enjoy that. And if you can't enjoy it, regardless of what happens next week or the week after, then you don't need to be a fan. I mean, you can do whatever you want. I'm not telling you you can't be, but you're wasting your time because part of being a fan is to be able to enjoy this stuff when it happens. If you can't, I don't see the point. Yeah, exactly. Because if you're just going to be grouchy because they, they managed to win a big time game and you're like, well, it was, you know, you find 18 reasons to be mad over it. You, it, it, it you're not really a fan, right? You're well, not I don't really know, a fan. But, but think about the players. Are you saying they shouldn't be that way because they're going ape? Well, I hope. So they can go ape, but you can sit back and say, you know what, that's not a big deal. I mean, you just, I don't, I don't get it, but whatever. I, I mean, I just don't think that's a very fan, right? The <laughs> the word fan. I just don't think that's that's a very good way to be a fan. You can be mad after losses. Be, it's enjoy the wins. Enjoy them. Enjoy right it. Right now. Enjoy right now. Exactly. You haven't now, lost listen, next week. You haven't week. lost next week. Enjoy, enjoy it. Basketball season is beginning. Right. It's going to be a fun enjoy night. It. They, yes. They're not going to lose in basketball tonight. Listen, if they lose to Alcorn State, man, we record this before that game yeah. is being played, but if they lose to Alcorn State, a, team, a team that is that lost to Texas A&M in the NIT in 2022, no, no, no. I just, I can't. I can't. <laughs> Marty Bird's proxy asks, if the offense at least holds serve the rest of the way, at least similar production um, as Saturday, do you see Kenny Guyton being given the reins of the offense next season? We could and have done worse. And do you see any analysts being brought on board next year? Well, in my mind, he took a big step forward. Hmm. And what I'm saying is that unless something goes backwards here, if you look at the reaction of those players to him, it's hard for me to imagine Sam Pittman saying, I'm going to go outside, find somebody else, and bring him in and say, players, I know you like Guyton, I know you really, but I'm sorry, he's not the guy. I don't know that you want to face them and say that. Now, if things go south, it's a different story. However, at his press conference on Monday, he did say that he now is a candidate for the job mm -hmm. because of what happened. He's a candidate. <laughs> and he said, we discussed that, and we will discuss where that leads later on. But again, does he have the job? No. But I think he's got a leg up on it, and I think it's a big one. And I think the hardest thing Pittman's going to have to do if he says no is face those players and mm -hmm. say, yeah, I like the way. Uh, look, this is hard to explain. But coaches bring a lot to the table. They bring their analytics, their X's and O's, their ability to coach and practice, coach in a game. You can talk about all this stuff. But the, one of the biggest things is, do they believe in you? Yeah. I remember Corey Beck talking about Nolan one time, and they were in an NCAA tournament game, and they got behind early, and then they came back and had a big comeback, and they won the game. And we're interviewing him after the game. And we said, well, what, what brought the turnaround? And he said, when we would have timeouts or when we'd just have a brief period of time when the ball was out of bounds and we were starting to play again, he said, all you had to do was look over there and see who was on the end of our bench and we knew we were going to win. Yeah. That's because they had faith in their coach. And that's what you've got here. you got faith in this guy. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to be, to me, hard for Pittman to look at them and go, yeah, he did some really good things, but he's going back to be the wide receivers coach, and we're bringing this other guy in because, boy, he's really good. Yeah. Well, now you're going back where you were last year. How do you know? How do you know how they're going to react to him? Yeah. So I, I think it's he's it. Unless something really goes backwards. <laughs> well, especially if he keeps putting, I mean, if the offense keeps going and, and putting up uh, 481 yards of 480. total. It was insane. I mean, that amount of total offense in a game, if you keep doing that, 
right? If you can keep producing big numbers like that, how do you look at a guy and say, no, you don't get the job? You, you did a good job, but we found this other guy that's done all this cool stuff, and players, you're going to like this guy. I, and they're going to go, yeah, like we were going to like the last guy. Yeah, that was one of the things my dad said, and you hit the nail on the head, Mike, is that as a coach, one of the toughest things, for, and some coaches have it and some coaches don't, Getting your players to believe in you and buy in to what you're saying, right? Getting your players, there's something about believing. There's something about going out there and playing for something, playing for the person that, that runs that offense or defense exactly. or, or head coach. So you're right. It, that is one of the toughest things to do. And Kenny, Kenny did it in one game. He did it. And, and Pittman is not going to make a decision based on what you think or I think no. or some other group of fans think or whatever. He's going to do it based on these players. He absolutely is. Because they're the ones that inherit whoever he's hired. And the recruits. I mean, if you're getting good uh, feedback from the there recruits. There was already a good review from one of the recruits. There was, a yeah. A wide receiver. Exactly. So. so, I mean, again, you can't not look he at it. He said he was probably more happy with it than Guyton was. Oh, oh interesting. Because he knows him already. So he's a wide receiver, so he would be recruited by him and know him. But this is the kind of stuff we're talking about here. Well, you also had two wide receivers on a visit to Florida that were like top wide receivers in the state, maybe even the country. And um, they were on a visit too, and they were noticing. They were seeing what was going on. They were watching Kenny too, so it also was good for – even when they were there in the swamp to have right. that happen in front of those recruits, right? right. So, sure. So, uh, Mousetown wants to know, are you concerned about the way Florida blew right by our defense, scoring in three plays right after the offense gave us the lead with four and a half to go in the game? We seems like we can't get our offense and our defense playing together. Well, first of all, this has happened before. I, I, I'm not going to go into details here, but Arkansas has given the, our, this team the lead late before, and the defense couldn't hold it. Here's what's happening when that happens. You have that defense on the field way too much. They're keeping the game close. They're doing everything they can to hoping that the offense will make a move at the end of the game because they're not making a move in the middle of the game. And then when it gets to the point where they do that, the defense is gassed. And I think that's what happened here. Because not only did they go right down and score again, then the offense went down and at least kicked a field goal, and they came right back and were going to kick it. Well, actually got to kick another one, and they missed it, even though it apparently shouldn't have they been able to allow have to kick it. shouldn't have kicked it, but that's a whole other thing. So that, you know, that's not being on the same page. But now go back and look at the overtime, because if I'm a coach on this team, that's what I'm doing this week. I'm saying, guys, I get the whole team together. I'm Pittman. I get them all together. You're sitting in this room. You got offense over here. You got defense over here. And I'm showing them the overtime. Because what happened in the overtime? You win the toss. Defense takes the field first. And they didn't waste any time. They, they went out and immediately forced them to kick a field goal. It didn't take hardly any time at all. I think three plays. And you got to kick a field goal. Then the offense came out on the field. First play, first down. Oops, penalty. Uh-oh, not that again. It didn't look like Backed they were going to score. Just went, okay, first down, first down, touchdown. There's no drama here. There's no sitting there, ng -ng 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 -ng, all that. The defense did their job, boom. The offense went out and did their job, boom. And that's the way you win. And I'm more encouraged by what happened in that overtime period than any other thing about this because that's what won the game. They did, they were on the same page in that overtime, and it wasn't just that they were on the same page. They just went out and did it fast. It wasn't like, oh, we're going to hope we can do this. Just it, it was like they... Take this, Florida, you lost. <laughs> it was so... It almost happened so quickly. You were like, if you were standing there... The, I was going, you were, you were what, going what, they what, won? What, wait a minute. <laughs> what is that going happened? on here? When they got that penalty, I went, uh-oh, here we go again. Yeah. And then... Phew, yeah. It's it was, over. It, yep. That was exactly first how down, I felt. First down, first down, touchdown. I looked and I was Two in my... Two running plays and a pass play. <laughs> I was filming it and I go, it's over? It's, it was over? What? They won? They won? It was just like, that's exactly how it happened. It was so quick. Everyone was firing on all cylinders. You couldn't have asked for a better overtime. Yeah. You couldn't so have asked for a better the overtime. There's the answer to that question. I like it. De DeWitt Razorback asks, with the way the season has gone for KJ up until the Florida game, do you think there's a decent chance that we could see him back for his final year of eligibility? You know, Matt Jones, the former quarterback, said on the radio on Monday that he thinks he's coming back. Now, I don't know if he has inside information what? or what. <laughs> Yeah, that's what he said. Oh, oh okay. Then he right. asked me what I thought because I was on the show this morning, uh, which is Monday morning. 
And I said, man, look, I don't know. I got no idea. Uh, again, I mean, I'm not tuned into J, uh, KJ's br wavelength or brain waves or anything. <laughs> so I don't have any advanced knowledge on what he's going to do. I will say this. If he does that, what happens to Criswell? Because they brought Criswell in to be the quarterback next year. And if I got to believe he's gone, but I don't know what he does. Can he transfer again and not lose this year? Because yeah, this is a red shirt year yeah. for him, but... I don't know what, what that would do, uh, but I, I look at it this way, too. You didn't have the year you wanted. I think a lot of KJ is going to depend on what kind of draft feedback he gets. Mm -hmm. But here's what people are telling me, and this is you got to look at this. His NIL money is up there, past a half million a year. So you get arguments about how much it is, but it's up there pretty high. Yeah, it is. And they're saying he's going to make more money here than he would be if he went into the draft this next this this next spring because he's probably not going to be a high draft pick and he may be out of the whole thing before the summer's over. So how much money are you going to make whatever deal you get from signing and then you don't even last? So, yeah, he could come back another year still if he still gets those that, that same NIL deal, he's making some more money again. This is where NIL comes in. And then he's got another year to put himself in a position where they're going to look at him more favorably. So I can see it happening. I just don't know if it's going to happen. Well, I think you you need to know when it gets a little bit closer to the draft what his predict you know where he's predicted right. and all Th of those what things. That's will decide it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, because he could still show out and show up. Yeah. You look at if a they guy. Well, you look at a guy like Anthony Richardson last year for the Gators, where he didn't have the greatest of seasons with Florida, but he was still a very high draft pick. Yeah, and if if Arkansas were to win out, I'm not saying they will, but if they were, you're talking about beating Missouri. And let's say they go to a bowl game and win a bowl game, and let's say in all of those games, K.J. looks like he did against Florida, then he's back where he was. Yeah. So there's just a lot of ifs on this. Absolutely. I think you've got to get a little bit closer, find out what happens at the end of the season, and see where he is after, you know, the combine and all of those things, too. Uh, Mike E. says, Mike E., Mike E. says, about the next guy, is there an offensive coordinator out there who could take a program like ours and step into the head coach role and run with it? I don't think that's what, when, when the time comes when uh, Hunter Juracek does bring in a new coach here. I don't think he's going to look at an offensive coordinator somewhere because he was a hot shot somewhere. And I don't think he's going to go for a retread like Tom Herman, you know, or some of those. Or Dan guys. Mullen. Dan Mullen. I don't think he's going to go <laughs> that route. Okay. Here's what I think he'll do. I think he'll look at a guy that maybe even in several, but a younger guy, but let's say he starts off as a head coach at a D2 school, but he's, he's rebuilding a program that's not winning, and he wins there for four or five years and builds them up and has success and wins championships. And then maybe he jumps to a mid-major. He jumps from D2 to a mid-major in Division I, and he does the same thing. He rebuilds a program. So now he's won, rebuilt two programs at two different levels. If a guy can do that, he can do it in the SEC. He can do it anywhere because he's proven – that he can take something that's not working and make it work. And the guy at Kansas is a, is a good example mm -hmm. of that. So I think that's the route that he would go. But I'm just guessing. I don't know for sure. Well, it also depends on the situation, who's available. I mean. I just don't see a retread. I don't, I don't see a, an assistant, uh, you know, an offensive coordinator. I just think you, he's going to look at somebody. Musselman had done that. Musselman had built a program up at Nevada and had won, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. He didn't just have, like, flash in the pan. He had proven what he could do. And I think that's the way he's going to go. Well, yeah, and you also have other connections with Musselman, with his dad and the NBA and things like that that also boost a resume. So, I mean, it could – it just really depends on – because you're asking when Pittman – if Pittman gets fired, right? That's well, what, no, let's say in a year or two. It doesn't matter oh, when okay, it is. okay, all right, okay. I just think that's what he's going to do. Okay, interesting. Semper A. Hogg asks, what is the deal with the crazy officiating in the swamp? Well, man, this question was asked so much on Saturday. I get that you can't get every call right, but playing in the swamp always seems to bring out the worst in the refs to Arkansas's disfavor. Well, what we're really talking about here is not just bad calls, but bad calls that are perceived to have won the game for the other team. In other words, if they don't make that incorrect call, we win the game. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was the 2009 game. Could have happened if the guy kicked the field goal in this that, one. Yeah, that was the 2009 game. That was that stupid Auburn game where they made that horrible mistake and allowed Auburn to kick the field goal to win the game, which should have never happened. 
So in this one, there were two plays like that. I don't know about the first one. One of them was a uh, forward progress thing where, where I don't know, I can't remember now if it was a receiver or running back, but he had the ball. He still had forward progress. His own guys were pushing him forward. He fumbled. You could tell on the replay that the whistle hadn't blown yet. And somehow they reviewed that and didn't call it a fumble. It was really and if, weird. If Arkansas gets the ball there, they're deep in Florida territory. They're going to score points there. So it could have decided the game. I think it was third quarter. But then the refs felt bad for that call. They they kind of knew they messed up. They swallowed their whistles on a, a few plays later <laughs> when there was clear pa- clear pass interference right. by one of Arkansas's guys, and uh, and and the whole swamp was booing. But I said. Well, they're make, it's a makeup call, right? It's a makeup, yeah. you know. They the know one, they messed up. Then there was the one at the end where they go down and they're in, they, but they they stupidly run too much time off the clock. What? They've got they have no time out, so they've got to somehow <laughs> get lined up and and cl- you know down the ball, yeah. throw the ball down and stop the clock so they can kick a field goal. It gets down to about eight seconds. Now here's the problem. They were substituting. They had guys, they had 13 guys out there at one time. They did. When you do that, you've got to allow the other team to bring substitute. And they just put the ball in play and didn't do any of that. And there's speculation that if, they de- if they'd done what they should have done, the clock would have run out before they could kill it. Correct. And they kill wouldn't the have ball. been able to kick the and field And they wouldn't goal. be able to do it. But ball but don't the, lie. So, but you know. there's arguments on both sides. Other, I've talked to other people said, no, 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 it's not the rule. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to get into that. I will say this. I have a nephew that's won five state championships in New Mexico, all right? Okay, okay. New Mexico, man. This is kind of boondock (laughs) city. He said, do you understand how bad our refs are on the high school level in New Mexico? They are horrible. He said, I've lost way more than one game on bad calls. He said, you can't do anything about it. The only thing you can do is just move forward and try to make sure that if one of those things happens, you figure out a way to win anyway. And in this particular instant, they won anyway. Yeah. So, that, hey, with it. well, that's what my dad said. My dad texted me, and, you know, we talk about it all the time when in basketball when a, when a team gets sent to the line and it's a great free throw shooter and he misses both of them, it's a bad call. Ball don't lie, right? right? And so my dad said immediately when he missed that field goal, he said, ball don't lie. That's what happened. It's a, you made a, made a bad call, and here you go. This is what's going to, sure. you know, as a higher power interfering with the game, as, as he likes well, to say. Well, there was say. a higher power, according to Pittman, if you heard what he said. <laughs> Yes. about that field goal. Yes, I did. Because he basically said he should have never been allowed to kick it, but somebody took care of somebody that. Somebody took care of it for us, and he did. Blood Red Hog says it's obvious one issue led to Eno's firing was that he practiced certain plays during the week but didn't call those plays during the game. Any guess as to why he would do this, Mike? The only thing I can think of, and this is pure speculation, okay. is that he's sitting there on a Sunday after a loss, and Things are rolling around in his head, and he goes, you know what? We've got to come up with some plays that work. Too many of these plays don't work. And he comes up with four or five plays, and he goes, these will work. And so we're going to work on that in practice. He tries them in practice, and they don't work, (laughs) so he doesn't run them in the game. But it ticks off Pittman. It ticks off the players. And Pittman said, again, of this game, he said, we ran the plays we worked on in practice. So... Whatever, whatever was going on with Enos, and that's the only thing I can think of, they didn't do that this week. Well, that sounded like a little bit of a – when he said that, when Pittman said that in the press conference, I went, ooh, that was a little bit of a slight. A little bit of a like. shot. But a that's the shot. only logical is that he kept thinking he could come up with a, pl- a few plays that would work, but then when he tried them in practice, they didn't work. So it was like, well, that, that idea is bad. We'll try some more next week. That's, uh, I, I just say, I, I can understand when you hear things like that, right? When you hear speculation like that, you can kind of understand why the players are like, we're done with this guy. We don't, we don't we want to play for that. The hog father wants to know which SEC football coaches do you think are actually on the hot seat this year? I think Sam gets another year, but not sure about Napier or Jimbo. Arnett was an emotional hire and Mississippi State may find it hard to let him go. All underperformed in my humble opinion. Well, I can't answer that. Jimbo, <laughs> again, it gets back to what, what, what was the number we came up with last week on the buyout? Was it $76 million? Oh, it was something crazy, 83, yeah. 83, something, something like that. Something like that. It's I've a, forgotten. It's a, it's a crazy You're buyout. You're asking me if Aggies have the money? Yeah, they do. Now, would they spend it to get rid of him? Because if you get rid of him, you got to pay that, and you got to hire another guy, which is going to cost you money. you gotta hire, you got to pay off the staff. Nobody thinks about that. 
But all of those guys on that staff, like uh, Petrino, probably Whoa. has a three-year contract oh, like Enos did. And he did. probably has a nice buyout, too. So you're going to have to pay them off. So you might get up around $90 million for that. And then they're having to come up with all this NIL money that they're trying to use to buy a championship. And maybe that bites into your <laughs> NIL money. So these are things that make me think maybe they won't. But I keep reading that they are. Yeah, so yeah. the drama continues. Now, Napier... My basic, not knowing anything about that situation in Florida, my basic instinct would to say, okay, he can't win any of these games. And at the end of the year, they're going to say he couldn't even beat Arkansas. And that's why we're not in a bowl game, so he's fired. But you yeah. have more knowledge than I do, and I you was, say he's not fired. Well, I was interested because, again, I read the forums, and I follow you know, Gators football closely. And I, I was reading the forums, and there was some guy that said, listen, I want to know where the fan base is at with Napier after this Arkansas loss. I don't think it's a good loss for them. I don't think – I think it's a really, really bad look for this team that he lost this game. What do you guys think? And I was utterly shocked to see how much of the fan base said, you know, we actually want to give him a couple more – we want to give him some more chances. We think Arkansas is a better team than that uh, than their record showed, which is true. We, we know that as well. Right. But they also said that he has some of the best recruiting classes coming in the next year and the year after that. If he can keep those recruits and stay high with those recruiting classes, I think he – Keeps his job. But I how, think he keeps how his hard job. is it going to be to keep those recruits if they lose the next three? It, well, that's the thing. Do you lose those recruits? And that's what some of those fans were saying. Can he keep those recruiting classes coming in? Because if he can, we're willing to give him a chance. But if he cannot, mm. we're going to... Bottom line is, I don't care. But Yeah, that's I know it. you that's don't. I problem. know you don't. I know. I'm like, that's their problem. Yeah, I mean, Mississippi... I think uh, the hog father is correct, though, on Arnett as well, though. Do you feel like he is a little bit on the hot seat? He's got to be. I don't know. I mean, you know, they kind of went with him, and it was just all the tragedy that happens there. Maybe. Maybe they go, well, thanks for helping us out because our coach died, but you're a schmo, so go away. I I, mean. I've seen a lot of their fan base talking about coaching hires, talking about. Okay. So, so maybe they're, they sound like they're out on him. Again, I'm not as dialed in with the Mississippi State fan base as I am with the Florida fan base, but he could be. A little bit on the hot seat after this season. Revolution asks, what football coaches around the country do you admire the job they do? Anyone under the radar? Same question with basketball and baseball, too, if you have an opinion. I've always been a Saban guy. <laughs> I know there's, you have. There's nobody like Saban. I mean, he's won more games than anybody, more championships. I mean, I guess if you went back to Newt Rockney, that's how old I am. I used to read books in the library at school. We had a library period, and I go in there and read about Newt Rockney. He was 105 and nine or something it was incredible his winning record but that's not modern football that's not playing in the sec the thing about saban is and i want to make a comparison between saban and alabama and what happens at texas because both of those schools recruit five-star guys when was the last time texas won a national championship a million years ago they should win one every three or four years and they don't and it's because they can't get those five stars to play hard. They come in there entitled, I'm good, I, I, I need the job, it's my job, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. At Alabama, you get your butt chewed just like a three-star, although I don't think they got too many three-stars. But I don't care how big a recruit you are, Saban will jump all over you, and he's got those five stars playing hard. And that's what makes him different. So he's a guy I like. Now... Again, I don't think he's under the radar anymore, but Leopold or whatever his name oh, is yeah. at Kansas. I mean, this guy's amazing, and he's an example of what I talked about earlier. He started off at a D2 school year, several years ago, built that program up, won, then got a lower-level D1 job, did the same thing at Buffalo, I think, and built them up. And then by the time he goes to Kansas, two, I guess three seasons ago, He's got them now, three seasons in, doing things nobody thought they could do. Yeah. And that's why I think you got to look in that direction. Because, again, if you win at a, one level and jump to another, and you got to look at the body of work. You can't, if you, if you see all these ups and downs and peaks and valleys, then maybe you go, oh, wait a minute. But this guy has just been all the way through. Absolutely. Basketball and baseball, do you have two guys there? Basketball, a guy that your dad likes, and oh, you've always talked to me, Rick Barnes. Oh, I Barnes. love him. Rick Barnes. I and knew here, you were going to say Rick Barnes. I know Barnes. Arkansas fans don't like Tennessee, but here's the thing about Rick Barnes. Compared to, say, Bruce Pearl, doesn't cheat. He's honest. He is. He's you very like honest. That. Yeah. 
uh, he, he's not a, a trash talker. He doesn't get on his sm smart off mm -hmm. and say terrible things. So you like that. And he's good to his players. He is. He, lo he loves very, his players. Very, very good to his players. So I like him. Uh, baseball, the guy at LSU, what's his name? Jay Johnson. Yeah. yeah I, li it? I like him because if you go back far enough, when Arkansas joined the SEC, what I remember is they were good every year. And you just, as good as Norm DeBryan was and his teams were, they just couldn't ever seem to beat those guys. Mm. And then he is gone, and then they start coming up with these other clowns, and they're just not the same thing. <laughs> and, and LSU becomes beatable for a long time. Well, this guy's come back in, and he's won a national championship. And so he's a guy I look at. He's not Dave Van Horn in my mind, not mm. yet, but he's a guy that is Dave Van Horn-like. So okay. I, right now I'd say him. I, li I like all three of those. I think those are a really good one. You, did you say Nick Saban over Lance Leipold or no? Well, I don't – there's – no. No, just kind of the same. They're like two guys just you respect. one is like he was asking about under the radar, and he's not under the radar anymore. But not, not anymore. I don't know who's under the radar right now. I don't pay, <laughs> that, I don't pay enough attention to what, what else is out there. I know. But those are, good, those are good answers. I like those. Parallax Pig wants to know, what are your most unique memories of Arkansas facilities? Mine was at a student, was as a student, in Eddie Sutton's first years. We were sitting in bleachers at Barnhill watching the game. The track team had a pole vault pit behind us. They would practice vaulting while the game was going on. Yeah, That's go, insane. Yeah, I go back far <laughs> enough to remember there was this huge dirt area behind the south stands. The south stands were erector set stands. They just brought them in during basketball season and put them all together and I don't know, held about a thousand people or 500 or whatever. So they're sitting there and right behind them is this huge area that's nothing but dirt. And what I remember, I never saw a pole vault thing going on back there during a game, but I do remember sitting there during a game. And the Barnhill had these, before they renovated, had these high windows all the way around near the top. Oh, and they cool. were rectangular, long rectangular windows. And so the light would come streaming through those windows. And you would look up there at timeout during a basketball game and you'd just see these particles of dust floating <laughs> everywhere. And you'd think, <laughs> I'm going to die of lung disease. Oh, no. You know, sitting in this place, I was just, I wanted, I wanted the game to be over. I wanted to get the heck out of there because like... it was a nasty place. <laughs> Thankfully, I only had to put up with that for one year and then they renovated it and it's not like that anymore. But that's not my story. My story is this okay. and I stumbled into this. Old Razorback Stadium before it was Reynolds Razorback Stadium. The fans probably never noticed this because you come in off the sidewalk and you're actually on a kind of an elevated walkway. It's concrete with steel supports. If you really got to the edge and looked down, you could see down below, but it was, there wasn't a lot of light down there, so you probably couldn't see what was down there. And I sure couldn't, but one day I was on, in the south end zone, and again, they have the erector set seats in the south end zone, but they only go to, the, to about where the sidelines are, and then you've got this wide area where you could actually drive a, a, a vehicle up and, and unload stuff onto the field. Wow. So there was a big space there, and then they had a half house over here where years ago the teams would, would go and dress. But I'm looking, I'm standing there one day, and I start looking, and I notice around the corner underneath the stands I'm seeing a bunch of stuff, and I'm going, what's that? So I walked over there, and I looked, and it was like a junk pile. What? There were like what? old hurdles from track. There was like some steel part of an old pole vault thing laying sideways. There, were, there was an old blocking dummy sled thing there, metal that was kind of turned over. And there were all these tackling dummies that were laying at, around and all kinds of other stuff, baseball nets and things like that. And I'm going, what is this stuff? So Dean Weber's walking by. He's a longtime trainer for the football team and, and was really close to Frank. And Dean knew everything. So he's walking by and go, hey, Dean, come over here. And he walks over and I said, what is all that stuff? And he said, well, he said, Frank always believed we don't have a lot of money. This was for the TV money and all that. Arkansas had to raise its money from ticket prices, which were the lowest in the Southwest Conference, and maybe what they could get with money to the foundation. But Arkansas didn't have a lot of money to play with in those days with football. And Frank always wanted to spend his money on getting an offensive and defensive coordinator. He paid top dollar for that, but he was cheap on everything else. <laughs> so they have this new broil center, and everything's nice over there. But he said there's nowhere over there to store anything. And Frank doesn't want to build anything anywhere around here to, for storage. And he said 
He ought to get rid of all this stuff, but I know what he's thinking. Maybe somebody will come along and buy all this junk, and he can make some money off of it. And so he, he can just make piles some it money. under there That's great. and leaves That's it. Great. So hoping that someday somebody will come along, hey, can I buy this pole vault pit or oh whatever they're doing? Oh, my gosh. Now, I don't know what happened to all of it. I do know that when they renovated in 99 and they built Reynolds Razorback Stadium, they built the stands on the south side. They went underneath that lower level and they created a walkway in there with a nice wide concrete uh, uh, sidewalks or things you could walk on. And then they put in these bowl cases, the glass cases that had like a bowl game from 1946 okay, yeah, yeah. or 38 or whatever. It had photos and, and trophies and mementos. And they've done it on both sides. If you walk underneath, it's on the lower level of both sides. So now you walk in that lower level and there's stuff down there. Mm. But in those days, it was just junk. It was dirt and junk. <laughs> it so was that's a junk my, pile. That's my, that's my facility story. If you took the average young fan of today, anybody under 40 really, and showed them what the facilities were like in 75 when I got here, they would freak out. Oh, they would. They you, absolutely How do you ever would. win like that? And I don't know. I don't know how Frank won a national championship and almost won two more in the 60s because Arkansas's facilities, aside from War Memorial Stadium, were poop. We're terrible, yeah. <laughs> that is so funny. I wish you had a picture of that. I really do. I, I got a picture in my mind. I like, know, I know. Can you imagine just pulling that picture out and go, what is that? That's a junk pile that I saw outside. This is ridiculous. With the Razorback facility, that's funny. Uh, Hot Dogger asks, what is the deal on Jersey Wolfenbarger? She headed to the transfer portal. Okay, you know more about this than me because you oh, broke yeah. the story. But <laughs> here's what I think happened. She entered the portal. Okay. Then realize you can't really enter the portal right now because you can't go anywhere from the portal until yeah. next spring. Yeah. So she got out of the portal with the idea that she will get back in it when you can actually transfer, and that will be next spring. I, in fact, I think the first day is the day that the pairings are announced for the Women NCAA Tournament. So Yes, it's the, after the Monday after Selection Sunday. Okay. So that's so when that's the portal So that's what opens. she's waiting for. Um, and I will give Mike Neighbors credit here because he didn't have to explain it, but he did blame yeah. it on himself. Yeah. And he said he had a six-year plan to... A to, ten-year plan for her. Well, he was he? going to get her to the WNBA, is yeah. what he said. Well, yeah. what he was saying, in effect, is, okay, she could come in here and be a good player, but she's got some... If you want to really play in the WNBA, I have to slowly develop skills one at a time. So you won't necessarily come in here and be a big factor early on. So he was really just heading, she was just heading into year three, of which I think would have been five years because she could use a COVID year, mm. with the idea that at the end of that fifth year, she would be developed enough where, yes, she could go to the WNBA and play. Well, he was even saying maybe 10 years for to go overseas and then go to okay. the WNBA. That, so even, even the development of getting her right. to a pro team was, somewhere. He was really trying to help her, and he said, I yeah. failed. Because, and I think what he was saying, I just failed because she couldn't see that this was going to take a long time. Well, and also she's just a, it's, I like how somebody put it to me when they were talking about her. I think it was one of my, you know, another coach and that I was talking to in this whole situation. But they were like, she really plays like a guard in a center's body. Right. And she wants to be a guard. And it's like. But you, she's kind of just, she shot up and, and she didn't really know how to play to, to her, this body that she, right. that she got pretty quickly. And so, again, she, she should, you know, probably be a, 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 a center, but she plays like a guard. And so it's just one of those things where maybe oh. she didn't, I don't know. I don't we'll, know what we'll happened there. We'll see what she but. does somewhere else if they can develop her. But here's, here's what you got to watch out for. If she pops up at another SEC school and gets a lot better, that's not going to be good. <laughs> so yeah. we'll see. Because I think Mike Neighbors, as good a guy as he is, I think he's on the hot seat yeah. this year. He's got to perform. He's got to get Miriam Dowda. He's got to get her mm -hmm. involved. Yeah. And got to have some other things happen this year. And it's, it's they start tomorrow night so or Tuesday night Tuesday, of this week. Yeah. So we'll we, see how it goes. We will see. But you you described it perfectly. The biggest question we got on this whole when I talked about the story last week and I broke it and I said she withdrew her name, everyone thought that meant she was staying. It no. didn't mean she was saying staying. She's still, you know, no longer with the program and she will transfer. But you're right, she loses that year of eligibility if she would have stayed in the portal. I don't think anybody explained that to her. But like I told a lot of people, even though you have these portal windows, right? Even though there's this, this is when the portal opens and this is when it closes, 
it doesn't ever go away. The portal is always there. You're always allowed to enter the portal. It's just some people can even enter the portal and have exceptions to the rule, right? Mm -hmm. Where my dad's a D2 coach, and he says, you know, sometimes you can enter the portal and play for a D2. Like, yeah. well, let's say she wanted to play for UA Fort Smith. Yeah. You know, it, there's exceptions to the rule. Right, so, again, right. for everyone, it's like the portal's closed, the portal's closed. The portal's never really closed. It's just there are exceptions to when uh, okay. you can enter without losing that year of eligibility. And we're going to end off with this question. I know, oof, Mike. You, I'm not you, answering this question. I'm, I'm going to go on a rant I'm for a not second. Are you okay question. with that? All right. Well, this is our final question, and it's from Bass and Hog. Bass and Hog asks, "What is up with the Pig Trail Nation team wearing all black at Florida?" I know they knew the Gators were having a blackout for the game. Courtney is a Florida alum, but come on. Y'all are supposed to be representing the Hogs and not the Gators. Okay, there's one thing I will say about this yeah, before you, you no, give yo, the you explanation. No, you say it. <laughs> I don't know what was going on with you or DJ or anybody else, but I know absolutely that Alyssa wasn't doing the, the school colors of Florida because she hates them. Mike, she had, she had garnet in her earrings that day. She, put, she had garnet earrings on. She was not wearing okay. Florida colors. But I will explain this for, for Bass and Hog. One, Alyssa and I, we had a conversation about this the other day, and we wear a lot of, you know, black and white and neutral colors, right? Even our Pig Trail Nation stuff is only neutral colors and red is mainly what we have. So, like, look, even your shirt, Mike, red with that black accent. We have, you have a black polo, too, that says Pig Trail I Nation, do. right? Yes. Uh, DJ wore an Arkansas shirt that was black. An Arkansas pullover that and was a black, black hat with and a red, black hat with, with the red logo. With the red logo, and then Alyssa wore black. And our closets to stick up for us are primarily neutral colors. So your blacks, your whites, uh, we do have some red in our closet as well, but they're neutral colors. I will also say this: black is not a Florida color. Black is not <laughs> a guys. Black is not a Florida color. They were doing a blackout game because of a really good reason. They were not doing it in support of the Gators. So are they, you saying you guys were in support of the military? We That's were like, in support of the military, Mike. That's exactly what Alyssa I'm saying. I likes the military. I, oh, she does. And so does DJ and so do I. And, and the blackout was in support of our military members, active and even veterans and anyone who has served our country. We were in support of those people. And that is what uh, Florida was doing it for. They weren't doing a blackout to support the Gators. You were doing a blackout to support our military members. Okay. There was so much honoring going on in that game. And then, you know, I just think there were some Arkansas fans we saw walk by in black Arkansas gear clothes. And they were like, yeah, the blackout supports military members. So you're like, hey, awesome. We're all we're all support in support of our military members. So to you, Bass and Hog. I don't know if you don't like our military members, but that's why we, that's why we were in support of that wearing black, and we also okay. have primarily black wardrobes. I so. accept your explanation. Thank you. I appreciate my explanation. But also, Bass and Hog, if you want to contribute to the Alyssa and Courtney Clothing Fund, our Venmos can be found on our social media pages. So uh, you can buy them uh, some more red. Buy, buy us some more red. Why not, yeah, Bass and Hog? If you want to buy us some more red, you know I really like uh, at H and M, Alyssa like Express. You know the all those places will accept the clothes from. So I guess we're going to be getting some new clothes this week, uh, courtesy of our final question asker today. That's going to do it for uh, this week's Ask Mike. We'll see you next Monday to answer more of your questions.